Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a review of the newest of Canon's full-frame kit lenses, and that is the RF 24 to 50 millimeter f4.5 to 6.3 IS STM lens. This is developed initially as a kit lens to go along with the Canon EOS R8, and it is cheap, it's lightweight, and obviously it is probably not just for the R8, but for future budget full frame cameras as well. MSRP on this lens, if you buy the lens alone, is $299 US dollars. You can get it for about $200 in kit with the EOS R8 at the moment. Now, as we're going to see today, it does have some serious optical flaws, but it does offer up good autofocus, it has pretty good sharpness, and it has an image stabilizer, which is obviously important for cameras like the EOS R8 that don't have in-body image stabilization. So the question to be answered is this lens worth getting if you're considering purchasing an EOS R8 and considering getting the lens in kit? I'll do my best to answer that, that question for you today as we dive in. So we'll start by taking a look at some of the physical build and design here. We noted that this is a variable aperture zoom lens, means that it starts at f4.5 at 24 millimeters, and ultimately it is f6.3 on the telephoto end. Unfortunately, that's not a fast aperture to begin with, and it slows down really fast. In fact, you don't actually get out of 24 millimeters before it slows to f5. So somewhere around 24 and a half millimeters, it switches from f4.5 to f5. So between 25 and 31 millimeters, it is f5 at 32 millimeters. Uh, to 38 millimeters, it becomes f5.6. And then from 39 to 50 millimeters, it is f6.3. So it gets dark really fast. And so this is a lens that works better in good lighting conditions as we're going to explore. Now, it is a compact lens when it is fully retracted. This is what's called a retractable zoom design, by the way, I hate retractable zooms, just to get that out of the air. So if you try to use the lens before you extend it in the position, you will get a message on the screen that says, set the lens to the shooting position. So that requires a fairly aggressive amount of force to uh, kind of get beyond that initial lock and zoom it out to this point. So there is a pretty dramatic difference between it in the retracted shape and then in the extended shape at 24 millimeters to start shooting, which is actually ironically the longest that the lens gets. So the lens in its dimensions, it is 68.6 millimeters in diameter, that's 2.7 inches. And when retracted, it's 58.4 millimeters or 2.3 inches in length. It is lightweight, weighs only 210 grams or 7.4 ounces. Now, as you can see here though, it does grow a considerable bit. It grows about 30 millimeters when it's extended in the 24 millimeter shooting position. And so when you're actually using the lens, it's not nearly as compact as what it seems when it is retracted. This unfortunately is one of those rare lenses where everything is plastic. And uh, frankly, Canon is the only one that I see doing this anymore, but even the mount itself is plastic. And so, you know, the lens does have a slightly cheap feel to it. Now to counterbalance that, I have found that Canon's RF lenses, even the you know, budget ones seem to hold up just fine. So I don't actually have serious concerns about the overall build here, but if you're looking for something that feels substantial and well-made, look elsewhere. Uh, there is no weather sealing here. There's no included lens hood. Canon has a policy when it comes to non-L series lenses. And uh, frankly, it's not all that competitive at this point, but you're gonna have to pay an additional around $25 for a lens hood. Though there, I will link in the description to a, a budget one that you can get for about 10 bucks because uh, this lens could use the lens hood as we'll see in just a moment. Now, once you have this extended, the zoom ring moves smoothly. This is what I would call a rocker design in that it's actually at its shortest length in the center of the zoom range. And so it's most extended at 24 millimeters, uh, extends to its shortest position or retracts to its shortest position at around 28 millimeters. And then by 50 millimeters, it is extended back out again, though not as far as at 24 millimeters. Now on a positive note, I do appreciate the fact that we have got a couple switches on the side of the lens. One of these is the on off for the optical stabilizer, image stabilizer that we'll get to in just a moment. Then the other switch is, gives you a three position switch to where you can have autofocus, manual focus, but then also control. So that is going to affect the, what this front control ring does. 
The control ring is uh, has been an integral part of, of Canon's RF lens mount designs. It's one of the best features because it provides you a customizable touch point, uh, not just for the lens benefit, but also for the camera's benefit. And so it gives you just one more ring that you can assign a variety of values to. In this case, if you utilize it as uh, in the control mode, uh, whatever you have it assigned to, it will do that function. But in manual focus mode, it actually has a nice damping to it and a nice feel to it. So manual focus is actually nicely implemented here. Now the stabilizer itself is rated for four and a half stops uh, when used just by itself. If you're using it on a camera that has in-body image stabilization, Canon says it will provide up to seven stops. My experience, there is a practical limit for that, and I doubt that you're going to be able to handhold anything near what uh, the equivalent of 24 millimeters less seven stops is going to be. That is into the seconds, and you're not going to get stable results handholding that. However, where it's really useful is obviously going to be for handheld video work. And then also a little bit of an offset when you're shooting in dim conditions and you don't want to crank the ISO, you can handhold a little bit slower results and get stable shots out of it. Now we have seven straight aperture blades here. And so, you know, nothing fancy when it comes to the aperture. We have a 58 millimeter front filter thread. Minimum focus distance is 30 centimeters at the 50 millimeter end. So that's not all that close and your maximum magnification is just 0.19 times. So there's a lot of alternative zoom lenses that are going to best that end result. Now, as mentioned, autofocus is a strength here. We have a lead screw type STM focus motor. It is fairly quiet uh, and it is also nice and quick. And as you can see here, both indoors, it is you know, going you know, quickly back and forth. Not bad for such a slow lens that even in indoor lighting, it focuses fairly quick. Though if you get into really dim conditions, it will slow down a little bit. Outdoors, it's nice and snappy, near instantaneous focus changes. And I also found that my accuracy was good. I, I shot just a, a few portions portraits with it as a part of a broader session and I got accurately focused results there and I also found when moving around in video mode which by the way the uh, we're you know on the R8 you're using pretty much the same focus system for video you can see it stays locked on on the eye and in the actual video footage you can see it's, it's smooth and uh, it is staying well focused on the eye. Also positive for video on the video front is that rather than being really snappy back and forth for video focus pulls, I found that it had a nice controlled damping, but with good confidence. It arrives at the destination, no pulsing around, comes back and it's smoothly damped. It also worked fine for my hand test and I had to be a little bit more patient because it is controlled rather than snapping back and forth. But good results there, and I think that, again, probably the greatest application for this lens may be as a video or gimbal-based lens because it does show really nice focus transitions, smoothly damp, and so as a byproduct, it's going to perform well without kind of jumping back and forth. There is some focus breathing there, but the fact that it's nicely damped uh, helps to mitigate that somewhat. So autofocus, a definite strength here. Let's talk image quality. Now, I'll give you the, the big optical deep dive afterward if you want that information, but I'll give you a quick overview here if you're here for a quick review and to get on your way. This lens has unbelievable amounts of distortion and vignette. I think the worst that I've actually ever seen out of hundreds of lenses that I've tested before. And so on the 24 millimeter end, Canon leaves tons of extra room if you actually disable corrections, which you can only do by the way in third party software. You can't even turn off distortion correction in camera. You can't turn it off in Canon's DPP software as well. So this is an always on kind of thing. but. In Lightroom, I could see it without, in the RAWs without, and I had to max out, literally max out the correction, and still there's a little bit of barrel distortion that's left after maxing it out at 100%. I had to do the same with the vignette, slide it all the way out to 100%, and, and as you can see, there is a tremendous amount of extra image that is left there that Canon leaves. When I frame that shot, and the JPEG would show it framed perfectly tight on my test chart, but there's all that additional room to allow for all of these electronic corrections to take place. So Canon is clearly heavily relying on electronics to help to offset for optical deficiencies here. There is a mild amounts of fringing, though with a shallow depth of field, or not very shallow depth of field, I should say, with a lens with a slow maximum aperture like this. You're not gonna have very narrow depth of field shots. And so there is some fringing, but you're not gonna see it very often. There is a tiny bit of lateral chromatic 
chromatic aberrations near the edge of the frame. They're very easily correctable. That's a non-issue. I actually found that sharpness was fairly good. It does suffer a little bit at 24 millimeters in the corners because there's so much correction taking place. But frankly, because Canon is cropping off so much of that image, you actually, what's left is kind of gotten out of the worst zone. And so I actually found sharpness to be fairly consistent across the frame and across the zoom range as well. It doesn't sharpen up a lot as you stop it down. Contrast improves a little bit. Detail improves a little bit. Uh, mostly what you get is a brighter image because of vignette starting to reduce. But it actually held up fine. I did test it on the R8, but I did some a, a few parallel comparisons on my higher resolution EOS R5, 45 megapixels. I expected the lens to look worse. In fact, I thought it actually looked a little bit better. So resolution is a strength for the lens. The bokeh is only so-so. You know, small maximum aperture, fairly short focal length, and not a very tight minimum focus distance means there's gonna be rare situations that you can put much out of focus. And the quality of the bokeh is it's just okay. There is you know, a fair bit of ge geometric deformation, cat eye effect along the edge of the frame. And you know, the quality of the bokeh itself is just okay. I didn't expect much, that's about what I got. Flare resistance is a bit of a mixed bag. If you're pointing straight into the sun, it's not terrible. A few little ghosting artifacts. I found that the wide open sun star looks kind of gross. Stopping down, it looks fairly good. There is some veiling issues, however, if the sun is right out of frame, uh, you're getting kind of that spillover light, it will make everything kind of completely lose contrast. Kind of be nice to have a lens hood there, wouldn't it? And then so as a byproduct, you may want to get the hood for those kinds of situations. And so in conclusion, I, when I use this lens, you know, it came with the R8 when I got the R8 in for testing, so I shot some with it on there. I found that I personally preferred a lens like the RF 28mm f2.8 STM lens. Yes, it's only one focal length, but it is optically superior. It's smaller and lighter still, and I just enjoyed the overall camera better doing some zooming with my feet. Now, of course, your mileage may vary, and what the prime lens doesn't give you that this lens does is that optical stabilizer. And so, particularly if you're doing video work, this lens might make some sense to buy in kit. If you're just considering a, you know, an inexpensive kit lens or kit style lens for your camera, I would probably recommend that you look at the only slightly more expensive, it's only $100 more, the RF 24 to 105 f4 to 7.1 IS STM lens. It does all the stuff that this lens does, but obviously gives you a much more useful zoom range. And yes, it is larger, but it's still under 400 grams in weight. And so it's not going to break the bank. And it's also not one of these you know crazy retractable zooms. And so I certainly consider that to be a strength for it as well. Decisions as always, and I hope that this has helped. If you want more information, I do have a full text review linked in the description down below. There's buying links there. And of course, stay tuned and we will go into our optical deep dive together. So let's start by taking a look at the zoom range here. So 24 millimeters on the left and 50 millimeters on the right. You can see this being this set of trees here, set of trees here. There certainly is a considerable difference in framing, but this is not a radical zoom ratio either. Now, Canon is pretty rigid about the JPEG corrections. As noted, you can't even turn off the correction profile. So this is what you get in a corrected RAW or a JPEG when it comes in. You can see it's not perfect, a little bit of, of bend here and there, but overall doesn't look too bad. But here in Lightroom, I can expose what the original raw image looks like. And you can see that it is just a massive amount of additional uh, room that Canon has left for correction and a utterly massive amount of barrel distortion. You can actually see that there is some hard vignette in the corner here. And so uh, Canon is leaving lots of space for the AI corrections to do its work, but there is a massive amount to get done here. So here's what is left after I dial in a maximum amount of barrel distortion, which I'm not sure that I've ever done with a non-fisheye lens. And you can see that even after that, there's a lot of extra image here. You can see how much of the distortion is having to be changed. And so I have to then do a manual crop to get into this point. Now, I will say that you could correct this, leaving uncorrected and get a wider image if you don't crop away all that I have here. And so that is an option there. But you 
can see that it's not a perfect correction after manual correction, but we're kind of close to normal. But it is just an unbelievably unbelievable amount of distortion. Now, all the way through 50 millimeters, it remains a barrel style distortion. And you can see it's much, much milder by the time you get to 50 millimeters, as is the vignette. I could correct with about a plus 12, plus 13 and get a nice clean result. And about two stops worth of vignette in the corners. Now, there will be relatively few situations where you can create a lot of defocused area, a very shallow depth of field. And so as a byproduct, there obviously is the potential for fringing. You can see some of the blue fringing here in these places. And so there's the potential for it, but you're not going to see it all that often because situations even like this are just incredibly rare. Now you can see here if I exaggerate things and turn off corrections, there is a little bit of lateral chromatic aberrations in some of these transitions. It's not strongly pronounced and it's easy to correct for. I don't think it's a serious issue. So because this is sold in kit with the EOS R8, I've actually done this primarily on the EOS R8. And so it's not nearly as high a magnification or resolution, 24 megapixels versus the 45 that I usually use for these. So you can see looking at this, that in the center of the frame, you know, detail looks fairly good. Contrast is, is fairly good. Mid frame actually, it looks a little bit better by comparison. I would say that it strengthens a little bit through there and if we look down into the corners the corners they're not as sharp but really this isn't a bad sharpness profile and if I pop around here and look at the other sides we can see that the copy here is centered fairly good with a fairly consistent result all across the frame. Now stopping down to f5.6 uh, makes a little bit of an improvement. You can see mostly in some improved contrast. A detail isn't radically improved, but contrast definitely is. And uh, that's true across the frame. You can see that right down into the corners. Just a little bit more from f5.6 to f8 is available. Then from f8 to f11, things largely hold their own, but after f11, you'll see some diffraction start to come in. f22, which is minimum aperture at 24 millimeters here on the right. And you can see that the image has softened due to diffraction. This effect would be much, much more obvious if you were to look at a higher resolution body. Now at 28 millimeters, maximum aperture has obviously already closed to f5. You can see there's a little bit more contrast available in the center of the frame, also in the mid frame and down into the corners. You can see again, it's just a little bit stronger performance at 28 millimeters. And that's true as you stop it down a bit. Now by 35 millimeters, maximum aperture is f5.6. If we compare back to 28 millimeters, you can see that the results are fairly similar. Um, I would say that 35 millimeters could possibly be a little bit better in the center of the frame. However, in the mid frame, they're about a wash and down into the corners, we can see just a little bit stronger for 35 millimeters there. So nice consistency thus far. And finally, if we compare to 50 millimeters, maximum aperture is f6.3. We can see that looking in the center of the frame, things look about the same as they did at 35 millimeters. Here in the mid frame, roughly the same. And as we scroll down towards the corners, we can see that they also look about the same. So a nice even sharpness performance and even more interesting. I shot a test at 50 millimeters on the EOS R5, so 45 megapixels. I actually expected the image to fall apart on the higher resolution body. And what I can see instead is that it's actually holding up really well. It's actually exposing some more details than what we could see here at the lower resolution point. Yes, I think here maybe the contrast is reduced a little bit, but looking down here into the corner, I'm actually fairly impressed by the amount of detail that's there and all the various textures. If I pop over and look at the other side, the same is true there and we can see there's just a, a lot of nice detail so uh, surprisingly this lens didn't get worse going on to a higher resolution body if anything I think it's a little bit better now as noted bokeh is nothing special you can see that because it's hard to get things strongly out of focus you're going to get uh, just a little bit too busy for my taste here you can see there's a lot of geometric deformation as you approach the edges of the frame so it's it's not fabulous Here's a simpler scene here, and you can see that you can still see, say, see some of those same effects in the bokeh. The background's a little bit further away, and so it helps this image a bit. This image really kind of represented best case scenario as far as bokeh, because I, I got as close as I could to this uh, drip of ice here. And you can see that the background was far enough away that it is reasonably soft, but you don't buy this lens to produce beautiful bokeh. 
Now you can see wide open that there's a little bit of ghosting artifact here, but flare resistance is pretty good. Contrast still looks good. This sun star is just kind of weird looking with that pinch going on there. I like it much better stopped down at F11 where the blades are a little more defined. And you can see that it really didn't get any worse as far as the flare resistance. What is equally true, however, is that if the sun is right out of the frame, you get a pretty severe veiling effect where contrast is really list lifted here. And so there isn't anything dark in the frame. Everything is lifted up. So that is one thing to look out for. So definitely some pros and cons when it comes to the optics here. And particularly when it comes to the vignette and distortion, it's pretty appalling at 24 millimeters. Thank you as always for watching right to the very end. Have a great day and let the light in.